<laughs> this is one of the only times I get to have him turn the tables on me. And he threatens to bring out my high school year. <laughs> <laughs> wait until the next time I introduce you. Um, it's great to be here. Listen, it's great to be at FIU. I haven't been here in a very, very long time, and it's pretty remarkable to see how it's grown. Uh, my wife and I drove down uh, 107th, and we got very teary-eyed when we passed the uh, youth fair going on, because we used to come here every single year with our kids. Uh, my eldest is 22, and we have twin boys who are 18, who wouldn't be seen dead with us. <laughs> but it's really, really an honor and a pleasure to, uh, to be here tonight with so many of you. I want to thank Michael Gillespie for uh, putting this series on. Les is absolutely right. Someone who, like me, who puts on a bunch of stuff, knows that these things don't just happen. Lots of work goes into it, lots of vision. And uh, the, the lineup this year was pretty remarkable. And those of you who haven't heard Ruth Shack speak, you've got to come out and listen to Ruth talk, because she really, really uh, was a pioneer here in Miami and fought a lot of remarkable battles, not only for the humanities, but uh, for uh, uh, lots of other things as well. So make sure you come for that. Um, and I want to thank Les again for his very generous introduction. Um, Tonight, I thought what I would do, and, and Les's introduction was very appropriate, because I think what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to answer the question that's most often uh, put to me when folks find out I own a bookstore. Uh, the very simple question people ask is, how is it that you became a bookseller? Uh, early on, uh, when people would ask that question, it was asked with a kind of wistful sense of awe, like, oh, you have a bookstore. You know, it, those were in the early days. Uh, or even, you know, like when a lawyer would ask me that, uh, there was kind of a sense of jealousy when they would ask that. I got to be up in this law firm and you get to run a bookstore. Uh, but later on, as I got older and the bookstore wars began, uh, and in fact, Les wrote a book called Meal on Ice, in which he kills me off in the very first chapter. Uh, and there's this horrible bookstore chain that comes in and is responsible for my death. Uh, didn't happen. Um, so when that began to happen, those bookstores were began to happen, people would ask that question with a really distinct sense of concern. Uh, they were really, really worried that I probably wouldn't be able to put my kids through preschool if I continued with books <coughs> as a means of earning a living. Uh, but most recently, though, uh, with stores going out of business left and right, the basic question now comes with a, an often very unspoken addendum. And that addendum is that when I'm asked, how is it that you became a bookseller, uh, it's clear that I'm also expected to answer the question, and why are you still in business? Um, these are the questions I'm going to try to address tonight. And in answering them, I hope to touch upon many of the themes I think Michael wants me to discuss and explore, especially given that the advertised title of the talk tonight is A Bookman's Point of View on Why the Humanities Are Important. And just as a note of caution and a lesson learned, uh, make sure you answer your emails in a timely way or topics for talks will be given to you with or without your input. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really lucky though. Michael, I'm really lucky though that Michael is uh, such a smart guy. Uh, and he constructed a topic broad enough uh, to allow me to speak on just about anything I want. So thank you, Michael, for, for doing that. And I promise to answer my email emails quicker uh, the next time. Um, how and why I became a bookseller. Uh, it's really kind of, it seems like a simple question, but the answer lies in a very complex set of circumstances. I've just turned 57 years old, just a couple weeks ago. And because of that, my sensibilities were formed at a time that was very, very different from the time we find ourselves in now. Some of you I notice are students and you're younger. Uh, so you, under, you may not quite understand that the the 60s and early 70s, that's the 1960s and the 1970s, uh, were a time of no internet, no personal computers, no iTunes, iPods, iPads, or iPhones. In fact, there were no cellular phones of any kind. 
no CDs, no DVDs, and no FM radio, and only three television stations of any real note. I came of age in a world of vital records, typewriters, movie theaters, libraries, newspapers, and books. My heroes were storytellers, authors, songwriters, and filmmakers. The great good places I hung out in were record stores and bookstores when I was a kid. There was no greater calling for me when I was young than that of the writer. As a young kid, instead of, remember the safety patrol when you were in elementary school? Instead of the safety patrol, I was put in something called the library patrol. Uh, and there was no bullying involved. <laughs> we meet in the elementary school library every Friday and help out the librarian, Mrs. Kravitz. We had book clubs, we'd straighten the shelves, and she'd tell us about world affairs. It's the place where I learned the love of books, and it was also the place where Mrs. Kravitz tearfully broke the news to us that President Kennedy had been shot. That's how long ago that was. Although never really a bookworm, I remember discovering the diversity of what was written in those books in that library from a biography of Frank Gifford that I can remember as if I read it just yesterday to Black Like Me, to Flowers for Algernon. At home, books were also important to all of us in my family. We had the entire illustrated set of the children's classics. And although I didn't read them all, I was very comforted by their presence, which was literally right above my head. I was comforted also and frightened that it was going to fall on me if I wasn't too careful. In fact, I think one of the reasons probably why I was put in the library patrol was that I wasn't a real reader. Uh, and my parents probably felt this would be a good opportunity to get me to become a good reader when I was in fourth and fifth grade. And it, it really worked. During my junior and senior high school years, the world was being turned upside down in those days. The civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the free speech movement were all over the news. Underground newspapers, music, and art were exploding just about every place. And the SDS, the Yippies, and the Black Panthers were taking on mythologies of all, their, of, of all of their own. And one lone FM radio station started in Miami Beach playing original blues music and airing deep poetry readings uh, just on Saturday nights, and it had just opened, not very far from my home. Politics for me then was a new kind of rock and roll. I couldn't get enough of what was new, different, or just plain subversive at the time. Probably not unlike very many other 15, 16 year olds uh, living at that time. Just as the platform for musicians was the LP, political thought at that time was played out in books and alternative newspapers. Uh, believe it or not, I was probably the only uh, Miami Beach subscriber to the Black Panther Party newspaper. <laughs> um, and when my father asked me what I wanted for my 15th birthday, I told him that a buying trip to the Doubleday Bookshop on Lincoln Road would be just the thing. He allowed me, my father was a progressive thinker, he allowed me an unlimited budget that day, and I'm sure he must have been quite amused as I gravitated to the Delta Trade paperback rack and bought everything from Atrap Brown's Die, Dig, or Die, to Bobby Seale's Soul on Ice, to Abby Hoffman's Steal This Book, to Kurt Vonnegut's Cat's Cradle, real heavy stuff. <laughs> um, that though, interestingly enough, that those were being prominently marketed on Lincoln Road in the heart of South Beach probably tells a story all in and of itself. Uh, that Doubleday Bookshop was also where I bought two books that had great effect on me when I was in high school. One was Jonathan Kozol's Death at an Early Age. I don't know how many of you professors might have read that. It was a remarkable book. It was a book that told the story of the Boston public school system and how it was failing. And to this day, Jonathan Kozol writes about issues dealing with kids and education. He's a great writer, and one that I recommend to all of you. The other book that had great effect on me in those days, uh, at that time, was a book called The Dharma Bums by Jack Kerouac. How many of you read any Jack Kerouac on the road, any of that stuff? Well, this is one of his books that's not as well known, but called The Dharma Bums. Uh, these were two books that would cast a spell over this next phase of my life after high school. I was a high school senior living on Miami Beach, um, and its tropical nature 
basically was all that I really knew. I hadn't ever really seen snow, nor had I spent much time in wilderness of any kind. The only wilderness was the, uh, the, 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 the glass room beaches of uh, First Street on Miami Beach that I really knew. The median age, now this is going to shock a lot of you who are young now, but the median age, that means there were as many people above and below. The median age on South Beach when I was a kid in those days was 67 years old. <laughs> 67 years old. And every bone in my body as a 17 year old was telling me to head someplace else. <laughs> uh, it was just at that very moment that I read The Dharma Bones by Jack Kerouac. And in it, I found the perfect hero. I would become the poet Jackie Ryan. I'd live on a mountaintop, writing poetry, watching for fires. How I came to this realization while walking among the palm trees on Hibiscus Island, surrounded by Biscayne Bay, I'll never know. Uh, I don't really remember, but within months, literally months of that, I enrolled at the University of Colorado in Boulder and became one of the 4,000 English majors that were at the University of Colorado in 1972. No campus visits with my parents, no educational counselors, and to this day, I don't even think my parents knew where I went to school. <laughs> One day I'm in Miami Beach, the next day I'm on a Braniff Airlines plane for Denver. And the funny thing is, I really had no sense of mountains to the point where there was a movie out at the time where the whole theme of the movie was that there was this plane that had a bomb on it. And the plane, if it went below a mile, it would have exploded. So the whole movie, the plane is flying around. They finally realize Denver, the mile high city. So it landed in Denver and didn't explode. And I had this idea that Denver was built on a bluff. And that you could go around and look down like a Madrid. <laughs> and it was like a mile high city. And I'd be up there perched a mile high. I really had, I was pretty naive in those days. But that's where I was. Um, and times were very different. But I was really lucky, because Boulder in 1972 was the perfect place for me. Purely by chance, I wandered into a town that was just discovering its literary center. There was something at the time that just started there called the Naropa Institute. I, it was a kind of a East, it was based on an Eastern religious kind of thing, but it attracted lots of the beat writers. And a lot of those beat writers came to teach in Boulder in 1972, writers like Gregory Corso, Ann Waldman, Allen Ginsberg, William Burroughs, Tom Clark, all of those people who are, some of them are read today, some of them are not, but they were you know, sort of iconic back in those days. And as uh, a 17 year old, it was really interesting to be in a town with all of them and start learning about them. Readings were all over town, and the English department then was a very, very vibrant place with young professors who were just beginning to break out of the old curriculum uh, and course after course, uh, they taught wonderful contemporary works by people who, frankly, I'd never heard of before. People like Thomas Pynchon. How many of you have ever heard of Gravity's Rainbow? I know some of the older. Uh, <laughs> 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 I guess he's not one. What's really funny, the show that I had made you know, was Gravity's Rainbow. Well, the book was a big, thick tome, and it had a picture of a, sort of a rainbow on it. And as kids were walking around campus with it, I thought it was a science book. And so it was on, my, it was on one of my English uh, syllabi to read. So I, I read it. It's a fabulous book. But people like, um, like Thomas Pynchon, John Barth, John Hawkes, Joan Didion, these were all people who were sort of new to me. Uh, in one of my classes, uh, I discovered the writing of Henry Miller and Anais Nin, the poetry of Pablo Neruda and William, William Carlos Williams and the incredible stories of Isaac Singer and Borges. Uh, these were all just, you know, I was like a kid just sort of opening to all of this remarkable literature that I was being exposed to. Boulder itself was also a town with some wonderful small bookstores at the time. There was one that was called Brilliant Works, and it had a huge picture window overlooking the foothills of Boulder, uh, of the Rockies. It was gorgeous, and I spent hours there on snowy days, skipping class, and I would read my way through all the small little magazines, the literary magazines that they had there. Uh, in a 20th century lit class, I learned about different literary movements. And it was in that class that I also discovered 
that at the center of most of these literary movements, believe it or not, there was a bookshop. Uh, Paris in the 20s. I don't know how many of you saw Midnight in Paris by Woody Allen, but that's Paris in the 20s. At the center of that movement was Sylvia Beach's Shakespeare and Co., a remarkable bookstore. In fact, Sylvia Beach and her bookshop published the first edition of James Joyce's Ulysses. And as a little side, a little side note, I don't know how many of you have tried tackling Ulysses, but you know how complicated it is with you know, word games and all that. Imagine not knowing English at all and having to typeset that. Well, there were, it was all typeset by French typesetters. And so those first editions have some marvelous mistakes in it. If you, if you are able to get any of those uh, first editions, uh, you're in pretty good shape, I think, uh, because they're worth thousands and millions and all of that sort of thing. Well, that's Shakespeare and Company in Paris. Then in the 30s, in New York City, there was a wonderful little bookshop called the Gotham Book Mart. Uh, its, its little headline or its little tagline was, Wise Men Fish Here. And the Gotham Book Mart was this marvelous store that I used to go to. And it was one of those bookshops that had books three deep. So you know, there'd be one, you know, the shelves were like this wide, and they would have books like this. So you'd have to like fight your way through to the back of the bookshelf to find what you were looking for. Um, but the woman who ran that bookshop was a woman named Frances Stelloff. Frances Stelloff really fought some remarkable pornography battles in the 30s. It's because of Frances Stelloff that D.H. Lawrence was able to be imported into this country. It's because of Frances Stelloff that a lot of small literary magazines were able to come into this country. And she fought the really, really good fight on behalf of censorship in the 30s in New York City. There's also some stories about authors who got their first jobs in that bookshop. I think Allen Ginsberg writes that he lasted about two hours before he was fired. <laughs> uh, so that's the Gotham Book one. And then, of course, probably the iconic bookstore that's still in existence today is in San Francisco called City Lights. Uh, City Lights is where Allen Ginsberg's Howl was read for the first time. It's run by a man named Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who's still alive. He's in his 90s. And Ferlinghetti uh, created this world in Northern California that was so hospitable to the literary world of the time that he even started publishing City Lights paperbacks. And he started publishing these little pocket editions of poetry, some short stories, that still exist today. City Lights Publications is still one of the great publishers around. And it's because of Ferlinghetti that that happened. I think deep down, probably, even during his time in college, I harbored dreams of maybe being a writer. Uh, but very early on, I knew that I didn't have the patience nor the talent, which was really cool. Uh, to be one. But I somehow still wanted to remain part of literary culture. I fell in love with literary culture. I fell in love with the idea of writers, bookstores, publishers, what that all meant. It became very, a very heroic thing for me. So the whole idea of owning a bookstore took root right around that time, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. So I would travel long distances to go visit these iconic stores. I remember one time when I was in college, um, this is sort of a funny story. I went to City Lights, and this was in probably 1975, and I was 20. And I have a sister who's eight years younger than me, she was 12. And my parents were taking my sister out to San Francisco just as kind of a Thanksgiving trip. And I said, well, I'll meet you there, because I want to go see City Lights. So I drove across the mountains, met my parents in San Francisco with my 12-year-old sister. We're browsing in, in City Lights bookshop, and I look to my left, and there's Allen Ginsberg and Gregory Corso both browsing right there in the bookshop. I said, wow, that's pretty amazing. And then I looked, and there was a poster that said that night there was going to be a reading, a dual reading with Allen Ginsberg and Gregory Corso. They were going to do dueling haikus, they said. <laughs> so both of them were going to be on stage. One would read a poem, and then the next one. So I said to my parents and my 12-year-old sister, let's go. So we went. Um, it was really the first Ginsburg reading I'd ever been to, to be honest, <coughs> and the first Corso reading. If any of you have ever heard Alan Ginsburg read, you know that he's extremely graphic in what he writes about. He was an openly gay writer, and he wrote extremely graphic homoerotic poems. So his first one is about a 15-minute 
homoerotic graphic poem with my 12-year-old sister, <laughs> my mother sitting over here, and my father right next to me. It's really, really rough. <laughs> but it was redeemed when the poem is over. Corso, Corso, who is very rough talking, you know, New York writer, he goes, Ginsburg, I hope I can use a profanity. He says, Ginsburg, you read your fuck poem, I'm gonna read mine. And he said, when I was 12, I wanted to bite Sheila Finkelstein on the ass. And that was the end of the book. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look up for it. <laughs> you know, so the reading, that was the tenor of the reading. It finishes, I look around, my father stands up, my mother stands up, they give him a standing ovation. My 12-year-old sister, I think it changed her life. <laughs> But it, were completely, it was completely one of those redeeming experiences. So that was my experience with the City Lights Bookshop. And then, not too long afterwards, happened to have a chance to go to the Gotham Bookmark in New York. This was about the next year. And I was up there browsing in the Gotham Bookmark when I heard, he's here. And I remember asking, who's here? And apparently, what would happen is, Jorge Luis Borges, when he, you know, he was blind toward the end of his life. Whenever he would be in New York, the manager of the Gotham Bookmark would read to him, would literally read to him. And Borges was there in the bookshop being read to by the manager of the Gotham Bookmark. And I, you know, I wanted to protect his privacy, but I was kind of trying to get as close as I could to where I thought they were. I got a glimpse of him, but I never really heard the reading. But it was really thrilling to kind of be in that close proximity to one of the giants of literary culture. Now this was all before I was about 21, and um, you know, Edward Albee, uh, I don't know how many of you read The Zoo Story by Edward Albee, but he has one character say to the other character in that story, in that uh, play, he says, sometimes you have to go a long way out of your way to come back a short distance properly. And that's what happened to me. I wanted to do a bookstore, but I didn't even know what sales tax so I didn't know how I was going to do a bookstore, even though I knew I wanted to do a bookstore. So what did I do? I did what every other English major in America did in 1976. I went to law school. Uh, I went to law school in Washington, D.C., a small law school called the Antioch School of Law. Um, and I found myself more in the bookstores there than I was in the law library. So I really, that cemented for me the idea that I got to get out of the law business, I got to do what I really want to do, and so I drifted back down to Miami. It's a fluke, it's where my family lived. I dropped out of law school, came back, had no career, no way of earning a living. So I enrolled at the University of Miami and I got a master's degree in English and education so I could teach while I was learning the book trade. So while I was in school, I worked part-time in a B. Dalton bookstore in the Omni, the old Omni downtown. And I taught uh, high school for about two years while I was developing the bookshop. I taught at Southridge High School, I taught English for two and a half, three years, and I loved it. Uh, but it, it, you know, teaching English at that time was not an easy thing to be doing. Um, so while I was doing that, I had decided that I would try to open a bookshop. And so I opened a very small bookshop in Colgate, it's the one that Les is talking about. It was 500 square feet. And at the time I opened it, I was also still teaching. And I said to myself, if I can pay myself a salary commensurate with what I was making as a teacher, I'll give up teaching and I'll continue in the bookshop alone. Well, fortunately, I was making so little as a teacher. That <laughs> wasn't even what I wanted to across. I think at the time with a master's degree, I was earning $10,000 a year as a teacher. So fortunately, that's changed a little bit since then. So I was able to go full time into the bookshop. Um, and, and I did that in 1982. And as, as Les talks about, uh, the, that very first bookshop in Carl Gables was very small. It was only about 500 square feet. But from the really very, very beginning, we were able to make an impact in the community. We had open poetry readings that, that people would be flowing out of the doors. Uh, we had author events. And we even started a very small literary magazine back then called the Palmetto Review. Two, two editions, uh, if you have them, they're pretty, pretty rare, I think. Uh, Miami, back in 1982, was just emerging from a really bleak period, as Les said. Marielle had just happened two years before. 
Uh, Haiti was in disarray. Um, drugs were everywhere. The whole idea of the cocaine cowboys was not a myth. It was happening all over town. Uh, people were getting uh, shot up everywhere. Um, and be but because of this, because of Miami was in really kind of disarray, um, a small book like, like ours could really kind of make a difference. One of our very first readings was with Isaac Singer, the Nobel Prize winning Yiddish writer. He was a remarkable guy. He was uh, this real, and are you still reading Isaac Singer in college these days? You are, great. He was, the, he was, the, he was this amazing throwback to another period, but he had a feisty sense of humor that was pretty remarkable. The very first time that I, I was with him, I had, our bookshop was too small for all the people that came. So there were about 100 books left of his collected stories that I took up to this small apartment in Surfside that he was living in. And I gave him a little ballpoint pen to sign with. He looked at that pen and studied it. And it was as if it were the rarest thing in the world. I think he was kind of making fun of the fact that I gave him a little ballpoint pen. <laughs> but then he told me this story, which I'll never forget. He said that he had just come from a book signing in New York where they gave him a book party. He had just won the Nobel Prize. And his collected stories were just coming out. And uh, Farrar Strauss, Roger Strauss, who was the head of Farrar Strauss, gave him a book party. So at this book party, he's seated at a table, signing copies of his book. And he says to me that this very sort of, you know, well put together woman came up to him uh, for a book. And for some reason, he got in his mind that she was a writer, a struggling writer, or, or an emerging writer. So he wrote in the book, you know, keep plugging away, and one day success will be yours. And it turns out it was Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. <laughs> that's, that's the kind of guy. <laughs> uh, I don't know if they were true stories or not, but they made uh, At that time, I don't know how many of you remember, but Time Magazine had this cover piece saying, Miami, Paradise Lost, with a big question mark. That was back in the early 80s. Um, after Isaac Singer, we were we were able to have readings with people like Mario Vargas Llosa, Carlos Fuentes, Susan Sontag came to the store. I remember being introduced to a guy who was very shy. You know, I don't think he'd even published yet in this country, but it was Ronaldo Arenas, the famous Cuban writer, who had just come over from Mariel two years before and was just moving back to Miami. Um, we also, at the time, always had photo exhibitions. And we did exhibitions with people like William Christman Barry and Jerry Oldsman and others up in our gallery space. And the local community was growing too. The local writing community was growing too. The work of Charles Williford, who wrote Miami Blues, was being rediscovered at the time. And then people like Les Stanford were coming to town and starting the FIU writing program with James W. Hall. Uh, as Les said, Carl Hyacin was just emerging. Uh, and Dave Barry, the great Dave Barry, was relatively unknown at that time. He wasn't even living in Miami but his work was beginning to be recognized. Um, and they were all beginning to kind of emerge on the national scene. Um, not too long after I opened, about two years after we opened, I get a call from Eduardo Padron at Miami-Dade College downtown. Eduardo was one of the great visionaries here in Miami. Uh, at the time, he was the president of that campus, the downtown campus of Miami-Dade College. And he said, look, you know, I hear that there's a bunch of people downtown who, and you, who, I was doing something in Carl Gables, this festival of books and writers, and why don't we all get together and think about doing a big book fair downtown? And downtown at the time was Nowheresville. There was nothing going on downtown. And Eduardo had this vision of using the book fair to bring attention to downtown Miami. And he threw the weight of the college behind us. And here we were, you know, literally, it was like a, you know, a, a Mickey Rooney uh, movie, you know, let's start a book fair. We had no idea what we were really doing. I remember calling up publishers at the time. I had only been a bookseller for two years. I call up publishers and I say, look, we want to get this author coming down. And they go, look, you know, we got this new non prescription drug book out. We'll be happy to send that author down. I mean, they thought it was only old people, only beachy. <laughs> I had no idea that, you know, we wanted the best down here in Miami. And I was confident that that could happen. I knew the audiences were here because I was selling. I was selling as sophisticated an audience as anybody else anywhere in the country. So I was very, very confident that the Miami Book Fair could succeed because of the reading public here. 
Um, the very first year, we were able to get James Baldwin to uh, He came an hour late, but he came. <laughs> James, here's the story about James Baldwin. He was on a plane from Paris to Miami. James Baldwin was a bit of a drinker, but he was on this plane. He missed the Miami stop and ended up in Fort Lauderdale, which was the next stop. <laughs> so a car had to zip him over to Miami, and you know he came in while the speaker right before him was ending, fortunately. He came. But it was a thrill to have him there. But some of the names of writers who are no longer with us, you know, who we had at those very first book fairs, were, were people like Norman Mailer was there, James Saul Bella, Joseph Heller, Jerzy Krasinski, Ken Kesey, uh, uh, Czeslaw Miłosz, the great Polish poet, was there. <laughs> Bless you. We did a we did a reading with the the, the, the three living at the time Nobel Prize winning poets, Miłosz. Brodsky and Octavio Paz, all at one reading. It was phenomenal. It was like chilling to be there. Um, we, we were able to get iconic people, like Hunter Thompson even, you know, came to this book fair. Nobody can understand a word of what he said. He came. The great story with him is that he survived. Well, this is what happened with him. I, I had Hunter Thompson. First of all, what happened was he was due to come on Tuesday night. He never showed up on Tuesday night. He showed up Sunday morning. I don't know how that quite happened. He showed up Sunday morning. We had to find a space for him in the auditorium. We did. He needed to go to the bathroom for a little while. So I took him into the bathroom. I stepped outside. I all of a sudden heard like pounding on the walls. He was either banging his head against the wall or pounding. I don't know what he was doing. He comes out all refreshed. <laughs> he came out, he goes on stage, and he proceeds to kind of disrobe a little bit, took his shirt off, and then he asked the audience if anyone in the audience had any wild turkey. He needed, he needed some alcohol. So it was a Sunday in downtown Miami. And fortunately, someone in the audience did. <laughs> I don't know how they knew it was, I guess it's the Hunter Thompson crowd. So they came rushing to the stage. Oh, the funniest thing was the guy asked to introduce Hunter Thompson. Came stoned. I guess he figured he was just going to get into it <laughs> in some way. He was a professor at Miami Dade College. Like, what are you doing? Yeah, right. Anyway, so Hunter Thompson comes up, and this guy gives him a bottle, and he starts dousing himself with it all over. He couldn't understand a word. I'm like, like, what's going on here? The audience loved him. And the last thing I saw of Hunter Thompson was these guys who gave him that bottle, believe it or not, had a fishtail Cadillac convertible. And Hunter Thompson was in the back of that convertible with his legs, <laughs> <sticking> straight up. <laughs> and I said, Jesus, I'm, but I, you know, I don't know what we're going to be liable for, but we're going to be liable for something. Uh, but you know, ironically, through those kinds of things, I learned a whole lot. Like, I learned something that you never would imagine. Hunter Thompson and uh, Dolores uh, Kearns Goodwin were very close friends. Dolores Kearns Goodwin, Doris Kearns Goodwin who wrote The Team of Rivals and all that. They were close friends because they were both journalists in Washington together. She happened to be at the fair this year. So she watched out for Hunter and told me the next day that Hunter showed up in her uh, hotel room and slept on the floor, but he was OK. So I felt <laughs> good about that. But so the Miami Book Fair has developed over the years. This year will be our 29th Miami Book Fair. Wow. We, have probably, we have probably presented over 5,000 authors at the Miami Book Fair. There are very few authors you can name who have not been at the Miami Book Fair. It's kind of a really remarkable, remarkable event. And from the Miami Book Fair, other book fairs started developing all over the country. There's an LA Times Book Fair. There's one in Seattle. There's one all over the place. So you know, now I get people who come into the bookshop. Our bookstore is 30 years old now. I get people coming up saying they grew up at the Miami Book Fair. They got, you know, they, they got their love of, of books by meeting a young writer at the Miami Book Fair. Or they got caught up in the fight with Leo Buscalia, the love doctor. You know, you remember Leo Buscalia, the love doctor? Well, here's a guy who wrote a book about how to, how to be respectful to one another, how to love one another. There was a riot at his event. There were too many people trying to get into the auditorium for him. And actually, Eduardo at that time got punched by somebody who was trying to keep him. We couldn't get him up the escalator. But there, you know, there are all kinds of these kinds of stories happen, you know, that happened at the book fair. But from, during that time, during this 30 years, during this 30 years, we opened the second store on Lincoln Road in 1989. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been to Lincoln Road, but we have a store.
store there with a cafe there now. And uh, back in 1989, nothing was going on, really, on Miami Beach to the point where the Miami Herald had a headline story that said, Books and Books moves to Miami Beach. And we presented our first writer there was Ann Rice, who we presented at the book show for a signing that went on for about 12 hours, it seemed. And Ann told me a very remarkable story. Ann had a sister who disappeared and became sort of a street woman. And Anne discovered before she came to our reading, she had, she had rediscovered her sister, brought her sister back to New Orleans, and rediscovered her and got her kind of on the straight and narrow. And her sister told her before she came to our bookstore that her sister was homeless on Lincoln Road and that she used to sleep outside our bookstore at night back in the 80s, early 90s. I mean, it's just sort of strange kinds of, uh, kinds of synergy. So we opened the store in 1989 on Lincoln Road, and then we opened the store in Bal Harbor about six or seven years ago. So we have three stores that we own, and then we have four stores that are affiliated as Books and Books bookshops. There's one in the Cayman Islands, where I had all my money. There's, uh, there's one in West Hampton Beach, where I built this gigantic mansion right on the Long Island side. Um, we also have one in the airport where my private jet <laughs> uh, and then we have one in the Fort Lauderdale Museum, which also took my collection of Dali's. <laughs> so those are the other four bookshops that we have. Um, and now, at this point, Books and Books puts on about 700 events a year. Many of you in this room have been to some of them. I recognize lots of faces. Many of you have read at some of our, have been uh, guest authors at our events. Um, and, you know, I couldn't have imagined uh, you know, when I started out this odyssey, you know, reading the Dharma Bums so many years ago, that I would end up doing something that would keep me as connected to literary culture as this has. And being able to do this in my own hometown makes it that much sweeter. Um, so that's a little bit about how I, how I became a bookseller. The, the next question is, why am I still in business? That's a, that's a much longer discussion. I hope we're going to be able to deal with some of that during the Q&A, because I'm sure a lot of you have that same kind of question. Because what's always asked of me is, what's going to happen with books now that there are e-books? What's going to happen, uh, you know, what's going to happen to the written word? Uh, what's going to happen to narrative, to story? How are we going to tell stories? Are they going to be told in a linear way? Are we going to use multimedia uh, in order to tell stories? Just what's going to happen along those, those lines? And if that happens, and there are no books as we know them, what will happen to you as a bookstore? Well, the short answer for me is there are going to be books around at least for the next 20 years. And after that, it's all your problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's the short answer to be honest. I will, our bookstore will be vibrant for the next 20 years at least. Um, I don't think books are disappearing overnight. Uh, I don't think that stories are disappearing. I think the more you look at things today, the more you realize that people are hungering for more story. I think what we're dealing with right now in our culture is a distribution issue. It's really not an issue of whether there should be books or not be books. It's how you get your content that is being sort of discussed and, and, and dealt with. And I think that is a separate track and a separate issue as to whether or not there will be bookstores. That I firmly believe that people like to congregate. I really believe in the notion of the great good place. I believe that people like coming to places and interacting. They like coming to places in order to have a sense of discovery. Where else, it's very hard to browse on the internet. I don't care how many times you click that stumble upon button, you may not find that thing you want. But if you come into one of our stores and you develop a relationship with one of our booksellers who knows your taste, you're going to know that th you're going you're to be able to trust that they will find something for you to read, something that will stimulate you, something that will change your life. And so as long as there is that, what I think, that continued sense and need for people to get together, that need for place, bookstores will still be around. But make no mistake, it's not something that is guaranteed. When I started in this business 30 years ago, there were over 7,000 members of the American Booksellers Association, which is the trade organization of independent bookstores like mine. Today, there are fewer than 1,500 members. 
So what you see in Miami with Books and Books is fairly unique. And the reason why we're here is because of the support of you guys. We, there's, there's no reason for us to be here other than the support that you give. So, you know, while I'm hopeful that bookstores will be around, they're gonna take lots of nurturing. And then the, the good news that I can report tonight is that that nurturing is beginning to take shape. With the demise of places like Borders and these big chains that are having a rough time, in their wake, you're seeing lots of younger people opening bookshops. Brooklyn, for instance, in one part of Brooklyn, there are like nine or 10 bookstores right there. There's a woman who opened a bookstore in uh, Athens, Georgia, where the University of Georgia is. There was no bookstore there. They, this young woman raised the money uh, and opened a little bookstore called Avid Books. The author, Ann Patchett, decided that she would open her own bookstore in Nashville, where there was no bookstore. So the idea of independent, homegrown stuff is beginning to take root. Just the way in cooking, like the slow food movement, uh, the, the local movements all over the place are beginning to take shape. These are all sort of hand in hand. So I am, for one, very, very hopeful that we will continue to be in business and that uh, 20, 30 years from now, you know, maybe another bookseller will be standing up here telling another group about how they got started you know, in this very business. So I thank you for, for listening tonight. And uh, I'd love for there to be a dialogue if there could be as well and would entertain any questions that any of you might have. Any questions about anything? You know, what's selling, what's not selling? How do you keep up with all the, all the literature that comes through? I read every single book in literature. Twice. No. <laughs> what happens is that, like any sales thing, what we do is, you know, selling books, buying books, it's really an art, not a science. So I've been doing it for 30 years now. So I do all the buying of what we call the new books, the front list books in the store mostly. And, you know, you become, you know, it's the, you know I read all of the, the journals, all the periodicals, the reviews. I also see sales reps three times a year who show me what's coming out. And then I know the good editors, the editors who write books that, I mean, who publish books that have done well for us. But then there are surprises. I don't know if any of you know what the best-selling book in America is right now. Does anyone know, other than those who know? <laughs> okay, it's a book called Fifty Shades of Grey. Have you heard of that book? Okay, this is, this is like, it's a phenomenon. An absolute, I've, I've not seen this since Harry Potter, to be honest with you. It's the Harry Potter or Twilight for older women who are looking to re-explore their sexuality and sensuality. It's a book that takes place, it was self-published as a fan, uh, you know you know what fan, what fan fiction is? Have you heard about that? It's where you take like Twilight and you reimagine it in some particular way. Well, this woman who's British reimagined Twilight as if it were pornography. And had all the characters doing these pornographic things. Well, lo and behold, it caught on like wildfire. <laughs> so she said, wait a minute, I'm not charging for this. I gotta figure out a way to charge for it. So she stripped away all of the Twilight stuff out of it and wrote her own story around it. A compelling story that's kind of a love story, uh, and there's some redemption at the end. And she kept in she kept in a lot of the sex the sex scenes, which really sold it. So it's basically a novel that's about S&M. Uh, it's amazing to me that in the days of Rick Santorum, in the days of all this stuff, it's selling millions of copies. And she did it by herself. She self-published this thing to the point where two months ago, Random House bought the rights for like a couple million dollars. So overnight, this woman became a millionaire. And she's now selling her own rights as well. And it's like remarkable. So the idea that people don't want story is not right at all. And the idea that, that something that strikes a chord won't bubble up is not right either. And so it's just really interesting to me to see this phenomenon going on now. And um, they're, you know, they're, they're, it's very hopeful. I, think. I mean, I know a lot of writers who are not happy about it. You know? <laughs> I mean, this woman's making all this money. I slave away for years and years. 
she's writing a novel and she just throws this off. And, but that's what happened. Right. And, um, Royal Gables, I, especially, I, I browse books that are in English and Spanish. That's also very characteristic of Miami, you know, the, the, the bilingual. So, as a as a as a book man, you have to, you know, you're, and you're a book buyer. You have to get into the minds of gringos, but you have to get into the Hispanic mind as well. And so, I was just wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, no, it's a very interesting being in Miami. I mean, I would say over fifty percent of our customers are of of uh, Latino descent, Hispanic descent, 50%. Many of them have English as their first language, or primarily read in English. Uh, or many of them are also bilingual. So they want to read in the language that it was originally written in. So what we do is, on the Spanish books that we bring in, it's primarily, if, if Mario Vargas Llosa has a new novel, we'll sell probably more copies of his novel in Spanish than we will in English. The same with Isabel Allende will sell more in Spanish you know, than we will in English. So that's kind of the, our approach. We don't sell, interestingly enough, lots of stuff that's just purely in translation, like the new John Grisham in translation won't sell that much for us. Because I think people walking into our bookstore are familiar with English one way or another. There are and have been a history of a number of Spanish-only bookstores in Miami. Unfortunately, a lot of those have gone away on the internet because the internet has had a huge impact on specialty bookstores. That's why you don't see very many children's bookstores anymore. That's why you don't see very many mystery bookstores, because you can find it all sort of on the internet if you have a particular specialty. So a lot of Spanish speakers go to the internet to find their books. I used to go to a bookstore in New York City that had, speaking of specialty bookstores, that specialized only in books in Catalan. Is that right? Yes. Wow. <laughs> Very interesting. <clears throat> Is there any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, it seems like a bit of a segue into what I was wondering. Uh, to my knowledge, Books and Books doesn't sell any used books. Was that a conscious business decision to not branch into that, or do you think like the internet deals in that business enough? That's a really good question. I mean, we actually do sell some used books, not a lot, but we sell some. Um, yeah, it became a conscious decision to move away from used books because of the internet. Mm -hmm. If you go on the internet right now, you can literally find any used book just about that you want if you go to abe.com or any of those places. So we were, two things were happening. One, it was hard to find good used books because lots of people were selling them on the internet. And secondly, it was very hard to compete on price on the internet for a used book. So what we've tried to do is carry some specialty so we have some first editions. We also have some art books. The other thing we'll do is we've done it for a number of people that had very interesting collections that they didn't want to sell off to just a book dealer who wouldn't give them a lot of money for it. So we would take their collection into our store and we would sell it and then just split it with them, which gave them a little bit of an annuity as well if the collection was interesting enough. Interesting enough. But the internet has, has I think he had a question that I was going to like. I was just wondering, what kind of advice would you have for a young person uh, today that's just beginning to get into the book trade? Um, I guess more so on, uh, on, on the publishing end and uh, book making and books as a craft from your perspective as a, as a, as a seller and, and just understanding the, the industry as a whole. Well, there's a couple of ways to do it. Um, if you're looking at it from a publishing perspective, uh, there are a couple of really good publishing <coughs> workshops that are given. Stanford has one, Denver University has one, and Columbia has one. And these are six-week programs that you can go to in the summer, and you can learn all you want to learn about publishing. And a lot of people who break into publishing go to one of those things, and then usually find a job in the publishing world in this country. If you're thinking of books as art, more or less, or individual books, or you know, the craft of book making, that's a whole other world. And, and, and books as art actually is a kind of very interesting thing. And there, there are a couple places you can go for that. There's a place in New York called Printed Matter. You probably, you know that? Yeah. If you go there, you know, that could lead you down all kinds of roads. In fact, at Art Basel every year, they also have a book, yeah. and you can find stuff there as well. Uh, so that would be maybe the route that I would take, and maybe apprentice with somebody who could teach you something. Michael? Uh, Mitchell, could you, could you talk a little bit about your own publishing projects, like Leslie's book on the Railroad? Sure. One of the things 
that we did as a bookstore in following the, uh, the tradition of some of the other bookstores is we decided to get into publishing. And there were two projects that we did this year. One was with Les Sanderson. Les has written uh, a marvelous book called Last Train to Paradise. It's a book which tells the story of Henry Flagler and the building of the railroad from New York that went all the way to Havana, believe it or not. And it's really the story of the opening of Florida as a, a tourist thing. He really was responsible for the development of the whole east coast of Florida through the, uh, through the railway, railway. And Les tells this story in such a compelling, remarkable way. This is a man in his 70s who started this, this, this crazy thing to build an overseas railway in Key West, fought through hurricanes and illness and all kinds of stuff. So Les wrote that book a number of years ago. And it did really well. I think it sold a couple hundred thousand copies, if not more. Uh, in fact, in Palm Beach, they have it this month as the citywide read is Les's book. Well, it turns out that 1912 is when the train reached Key West. And so 2012.